Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the plenary session about AI in the humanitarian sector. We have a very distinguished group of panelists I will invite up uh, in just a few minutes. We also are in the much coveted spot of the post-lunch session, which means that unfortunately your attention is probably inversely related to how delicious the lunch was. Um, so despite this, I hope you had a good lunch, and I'm very excited to be uh, having this discussion about what I think is a very salient topic. So um, like Sarah said, my name is Kasia Shemolensky. I am a technologist uh, by training who's been building these kinds of systems, data-driven systems, AI systems, whatever you want to call them, um, for almost two decades. I've been working in industry and in startups and government academia, um, and I've had the privilege of the last few years of working with the center as an advisor. So it feels a little unfair. I'm introducing myself so vulnerably. I don't know anything about you. Um, and so I'm going to start today's session with a bit of an informal poll to get your blood flow moving. Um, if you could please raise your hand. Um, this is for the panelists as well, because we're just curious as we curate this conversation live on the stage. Um, if you could raise your hand if your organization has considered or has had discussions around the implementation of AI. So this is internally, externally, traditional, or cutting edge AI. Okay, that's a lot of folks. So keep it, keep it raised, keep it raised. I know this is like now trying to get to an exercise, so this is your, you, you can thank me. This, you don't have to go to the gym. Um, keep it raised if the systems have, um, have you, if you've actually prototyped or experimented with AI. Okay, amazing. And then keep it raised if these systems have been deployed in production and are running and being used on an ongoing basis. Signals, we took two signals. Okay, okay. Um, today, I literally something just launched today. Congratulations. Um, okay, great, you can put your hands down. So, I mean, what I saw there was a big drop between the experimentation, the prototyping phase, and the deployment in production. I'm seeing some nods, so that's good to know for a panelist. And then one more, I'm getting a little, bit, a little more personal, so I appreciate the trust here. Um, in terms of your roles, uh, can you raise your hand if you actually are using data tools and AI? If for your role you use data tools and AI? Okay, and then um, you can put it down. Uh, how about if you are someone who builds these data tools and you build the AI? Okay, okay, uh, uh, oh, I see someone with like a 50%, I don't know what that means, 50%, okay. Um, and then if you can put your hands down, um, and, uh, Anybody who's building tools or AI that is using generative AI? Okay, um, like about seven or eight of them. And then um, hands raised for anybody who wants these tools or AI, regardless of whether you have it or don't have it. I publish it. Okay, cool, very cool. All right, thank you for playing my game. Um, now, I've been asked to set just a few minutes of context before we turn our attention to the real stars. Um, of today who are guests from DataKind, Global Pulse, and OpenAI, so some experts in the room. I'm gonna very quickly try to hand wave at about 70 years of history so that we can talk about the present and the future. So let's see how I do, and you all can keep me honest when you come up on stage, you can fact check me. So um, I wanna just start by reiterating, which we all know that AI is not new. Despite the hype cycles that we're seeing, it's not new. Actually, the, the term was coined in 1956 uh, at a workshop at Dartmouth and it was uh, to describe the possibilities of creating machines capable of simulating human intelligence, which is uh, eerily similar to the definition we use today, um, despite the hype cycles that we've seen over the last 70 years. So 1956 is a long time ago. For context, some other things that happened in 1956 include the first Eurovision Song Contest, which happened in Switzerland. They also won, I don't know, man, foul play? I don't know. Um, and in the US, Elvis Presley made his debut. So this is a long time ago. Uh, and in technology, the hard drive was actually invented by IBM in 1956 as well. So the, the, kind of the, con the concept of AI definitely came first, the technology you caught up. And this is something that you see over and over again. So over the last 70 years, there have been many milestones for AI. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that AI is really fueled by three things. There's the mathematics and the technique, right? The approach and how you actually do it. Um, there's the, uh, the compute power. So this is the actual hardware that you need to run the computations. And then there's the data that you need to train the AI. Uh, and as one, two, or three of the elements advanced, we crossed a number of the milestones. So does anyone want to guess when the first chatbot was released? What year? Just shout it out. Don't be shy. What year? 84. 1884, okay. 1984, any other? 72. 72. 95. Okay, 1966, first chatbot. That would be a grandparent now, right? Um, her name, I guess, was Eliza. We were still feminizing them at that time. That's another conversation. Um, facial recognition systems began in the 1960s. 
right? Recommendation systems began in the 1970s. So a lot of the technology that we think of as being kind of shiny and new today is actually mathematically has been well established for quite some time. And it's when the compute and the data catches up that we actually see the advancements in what we as consumers will, will interact with. And that, that's kind of the same thing that we're seeing today as well. So ChatGPT and generative AI is built on transformer technology and architecture that was uh, launched in 2017, so almost seven years ago, right? And that's kind of what we, what we see over and over again. We've also been dealing with the harms and the risks of AI for 20 years, right? So the last 20 years, we've seen a lot of compute data, um, significant increase there. So we're more, more and more algorithmically determined, right? When you use GPS and you are applying for things online, um, all of this is using AI. Uh, and the, the harms and the risks have come along with that as well. So the exacerbation of historical and societal biases and increasing digital divide that's built on this analog divide, right, between communities and regions. But there has been an important shift, otherwise we wouldn't be up here, right? So there clearly some things are also new. Um, like I said, we have this existing technique that's turned into generative AI, right, this, this new kind of um, approach that uh, creates, kind of predicts the next word of the next pixel when you give it something, a prompt. Um, and this comes with this comes new opportunities as well as some new risks and harms. I'm going to leave that for our panelists to discuss. Um, and since only a few companies have the resources to build these large language models, we're also seeing a further consolidation of power in the hands of a few well-known names that you all know, uh, increasing that digital divide even within the tech industry itself. There's also regulation on the horizon, although it's slower moving than the technology. And of course, I think we need to keep in mind that a vast majority of the systems we're dealing with and that we're building today are still traditional AI. So we have traditional AI happening alongside these new forms of AI. Now, before we go completely off the deep end, which I'm actually quite excited <coughs> to do, how does this apply to the work that you're doing? Um, so rather than approach AI like a hammer that can hit every single problem like a nail, how might we think critically about the best use of AI to solve the problems that are faced by humanitarians? So today we're gonna to cover what's the current state of AI in the sector, how we should decide what to build, and importantly, what not to build. What are some tips around the actual building of these systems? And what would this look like if we actually succeeded?